Hi, Eric Singer again, dialect coach. I'm doing a map tour of North American accents. If you missed part one, check it out here. I'm starting part two from the south. Picking up where we left off, we were talking about rhotic accents, where the R sound is always pronounced in the Piney Woods Belt. But down in the southern part of Louisiana, it is one of the few areas that's still pretty reliably non-rhotic. Even though many historically non-rhotic areas of the South have gotten their R's back, this one's hanging on. This is also one of the places in the South, the Appalachians and Ozarks, or a few of the others, some parts of Texas, where you still hear a wh sound, words like which, what, where. You also get F for final TH sounds here, as in both, bath. Something I think is really interesting is that there used to be a non-rhotic pronunciation of nice words in the South. So words like nice, early, work, used by black and white Southerners alike that was a kind of a diphthong, oi, nice. It's actually pretty similar to that old-fashioned New York City toady toy street vowel sound. You can still hear it in some African-American speakers in Louisiana today, though it's mostly gone otherwise. Before moving on, let's circle back to Florida so Megan can tell us about the Cuban-Spanish influence in Miami. Hello again. This time I'm in Miami. The Latinx population in the U.S. is 18.5% of the population. But within that, we're a very diverse group of people. Before we get into Miami English, I just want to make it clear that not every speaker of Miami English is Latinx, not every Latinx person in Miami speaks Miami English, and the same goes for New York Latino English, and the same will go for Chicano English in the Southwest when we get there. We are not a monolith, and neither are the varieties that we speak. And that's because these varieties are influenced by different Spanishes. So just like the English-speaking world has different varieties, so does the Spanish-speaking world. There's so many different varieties of Spanish. There's Mexican Spanish, there's Cuban Spanish, there's Puerto Rican Spanish, there's Dominican Spanish, there's all these other Spanishes. There are all these varieties and they all have different features and we just don't have time to get into that. Miami English is influenced by Cuban Spanish. Like, take a look at this map. Cuba is very close to Miami. One remarkable feature of Miami English is the dark L. If you recall from New York, the dark L is in words like pole and ball. In Miami English, you'll hear that dark L in places where you wouldn't hear it in other varieties. Listen to the L in this native speaker clip. That's what I love about our language, 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 and about Miami. Okay, back to Eric. Thank you, Megan. Okay. Back to Louisiana. So there's a well-known New Orleans accent that sounds similar to New York accents in some ways. It's called yat, which comes from the phrase where yat, which means how are you? It's so similar to New York accents in some ways, it's a bit of a mystery. Even some really weird little things like bad and back not having the same vowel sound. I got a bad back. New Orleans had a similar mix of immigration to New York in the 19th century, but also very close shipping ties to New York City, so contact is likely part of the explanation too. Of course, we can't leave Louisiana without talking about Cajun. The Cajuns were a French-speaking people who originally came down to Louisiana from Nova Scotia. Now, some still speak Cajun French, but you can hear the influence French had on Cajun accents in English in the rhythm and the melody the way there's a tendency to stress the final word or syllable in a phrase, and also in the way final consonant sounds can get assimilated, sort of schlooped up into the sound before them, so that ham could just be ham, rent could just be rent, hemi to rent there. So continuing west to Texas, now one thing that sets a lot of Texans apart from other Southerners is that there's a lot less goose fronting. So the tongue stays further back through that whole vowel sound instead of coming forwards. So if I go from, say, somewhere in the Carolinas and head west and talk about blue moons and soup spoons, I'll start off with very fronted goose vowels, blue moons and soup spoons, but they'll get less and less fronted the further west I go. Blue moons and soup spoons, blue moons and soup spoons, when I cross the Mississippi, I don't have very fronted goose vowels anymore, but by the time I'm in Texas, blue moons and soup spoons, it's not coming forward hardly at all now. Now one thing that separates the eastern part of the state from the western part is how far the price smoothing goes. Remember when we talked about how Piney Woods Belt accents have full-on price smoothing, so it affects ride and right, live and life? 
We'll see that kind of full-on version in Western and Central Texas. All those words are smoothed out just like that. But in the Eastern part, it's only on words like high, ride, and live. Words like right and life will have a diphthong. Why is it this way? Well, again, because of the history of settlement patterns. The white people who settled in the western part, in the Great Plains part of Texas, the western and central parts, mostly came from Tennessee and the Appalachians, full price smoothing areas. As we head up into Oklahoma, I'm going to turn it over to Kalina Newmark again. Hello again. Oklahoma is a home to nearly 40 Native American nations, including the Cherokee and the Comanche. Before jumping into the local Native American dialect features here in Oklahoma, I'm going to share a little bit about the history of Native American English. Native American English is also known as the res accent or reservation accent. It occurs in First Nations and Native American communities across the United States and Canada, regardless of whether or not a heritage language is spoken. Native American English is often identifiable because of its prosody. Sometimes it's described as monotone, other times it's described as sing-songy. Within Oklahoma, community members describe Native American English both ways, and that makes sense. There are different varieties within the state. In Western Oklahoma, the Anadarko accent has been described as monotone. Contrast that with Cherokee English in Eastern Oklahoma, which is more sing-songy. Sometimes we can forget where we come from, you know what? With that, let's go back to Eric on the map tour. Thank you, Kalina. Quick stop in the Ozarks, where we can hear some accents that are real close to Southern Appalachian accents. A little bit different goat vowel and some others, but real close in a lot of ways, which is because, again, of settlement patterns. The original European settlers of the Ozarks came from Southern Appalachia, and we hear some of those same constructions, like a going and a hunting, as well as a lot of shared specific dialect words. Now, up in Chicago, and in fact in the whole Great Lakes area, we have one of the most significant ongoing changes happening anywhere in the English-speaking world today. It's called the Northern Cities Shift, or the Northern Cities Vowel Shift. And it may be the biggest change in English pronunciation anywhere since the Great Vowel Shift, right up to and through Shakespeare's time. Now, it's a change shift, which is kind of a merry-go-round of changes. Here's how it goes. So in most accents of English, the vowel sound in words like uh, cat, bag, what we call the trap vowel, is something like ah, right? We make it with the tongue cupped down low and towards the front of the mouth like this, ah. Okay, ready for this? Here's the first move in the northern city's chain shift. This vowel unit moves up in this direction. So it's pronounced with a little bit tenser tongue and sounds like cat, bag up here, put the cat in the bag. Now that leaves an open space in terms of available vowel real estate where that trap vowel used to be. Now it turns out that vowel sounds like they space themselves out in our mouths. They abhor a vowel vacuum, if you will. And so what happens is that the lot vowel, which you know normally lives back here, your tongue cupping low down in the back for an open ah sound, moves forwards towards where trap used to be. So in Chicago, it's not a hot pot, it's a hot pot. Now those are just the first two moves in the chain shift. The thing about a chain shift is each move makes the next one happen. So trap moving up higher pushes the dress vowel back in the mouth. So words like bed next sound like bud next. And then the vowel sound that was back there to begin with, the uh sound in strut, bus, lucky, has to move back further. Bus, lucky. So now, cot sounds like cat, bat sounds like bet, bet sounds like butt, and butt sounds like bought. Pretty dramatic shift. Uh, this whole area around the Great Lakes is affected by the northern city's shift, though not every part of it has it to the same extent. Besides Chicago, it's strongest in Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, and Detroit. Let's head over to St. Louis. Here's Nicole. There's a feature in African American English in places like St. Louis and Memphis called the Near Square Nurse Merger, or R Centralization. If you know the song by the rapper Nelly, Hot and Her, you have seen an example of this. It is her for here, or R Centralization. And you can also hear it in this clip. Girl, I told you I need to get my her done, her done, her done. Okay, let's go back to Eric. Thank you, Nicole. Can we talk about Minnesota for a minute? You know, 
People from Minnesota often complain about overbroad, stereotypical Minnesota accents, just going too far. Two really identifiable features of that are monothongal A and O in your face and goat bowels. But you know, there are definitely places in Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, and yep, Fargo, North Dakota, where you can still hear some pretty pronounced accents with some really monothongal A and O vowels. Now, but even in much less pronounced accents from this region, there will still be a bit of that. You'll also still get this fairly closed oral posture, so there's a contrast between lips that are pretty mobile and move around a lot and a jaw that stays pretty fixed in place. Now let's stop over in the Dakotas and I'll hand it off to Kalina. Hi again from the traditional homelands of the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota peoples. Continuing on our conversation of Native American English, I'm going to talk about two shared features. One, timing and rhythm, and two, intonation and pitch. In regards to timing and rhythm, Native American English is syllable timed, where syllables are more uniform and even in length. You can hear that feature in this clip. You see a piece of trash, you pick it up. For the second feature, intonation and pitch, the stress syllable starts lower rather than higher. And I would watch them. In this clip from the movie Smoke Signals, this actor is speaking in a Native American English accent. You can hear that on Thomas here. Hey, Thomas. There are several theories of where this dialect came from. One theory is that it developed because of Native American boarding schools. Established in the late 19th and mid 20th century, Native American boarding schools were designed to assimilate Native American children into white society. They did this by forcibly removing Native American children from their families and communities and forbidding them from speaking their languages. At the time of European contact in North America, there were approximately 300 distinct indigenous languages. Since then, 113 of these languages have been lost and many more are in danger as fewer and fewer Native American children are learning our languages. Despite all of this, we have created a dialect of English that is uniquely ours, a dialect that helps us to create and recreate our identities as Native American people. Let's go back to Eric for the next stop on the map tour. Thank you, Kalina. Quick detour to Iowa. So remember that online that runs through New Jersey? where above it, most people say on rhymes with dawn, and south of it, most people say on rhymes with dawn. And it runs right along a really major dialect boundary between the north, linguistically speaking, and the midlands. And it runs through all of these states and through Iowa too. Now, people don't necessarily think of Iowa having a lot of dialect variety, but here's a major division right here. So, Sioux City and Cedar Rapids are above the on line, so most people in those places say on, and Des Moines is below it, so most people there will say on. All right, so heading west now, over towards the Rockies, you know, one of the things we start to hear in the Mountain West generally is ing endings pronounced as een, so playing, going, singing, the whole western part of the country, so these 11 states, is usually considered one big dialect area. Now that's not to say that there aren't any differences, of course there are, but Broadly speaking, it's one area with a lot of common features. There just hasn't been enough time for really distinctive features to develop over here. Here's something interesting in some Utah accents, though. Some front vowels get lowered before L sounds. So we get milk, for instance. The word sale might sound like cell. Is this milk on cell? You'll also hear mountain and button, mountain and button, a lot in Utah especially among younger speakers, with just a pure glottal stop, uh, for that T sound in the middle of the word. It's not the only place in the U.S. that does that, not at all, but apart from some California speakers, it seems to be the only place in the West where you hear those pronunciations. We're gonna end this segment here. Please join us for part three, where we'll pick up in sunny Southern California. <laughs>